Hi, this is Dr. Tom Rogers coming to you with another podcast of the Common Sense MD. Some of what I'm going to be talking about today is really not common sense. It's pretty deep. Um, you know, as a family doctor of so many years, I think 38 years, you come to realize that, you know, a lot of people have emotional problems and trauma, early childhood trauma that really impacts their health tremendously. So a lot of times when I see a patient that has a laundry list of problems, they're on multiple medications, and nobody's ever really helped them, a lot of times I'll just ask them about their life starting early on. And a lot of times they'll break down and cry and things will come out. And I'm sure that this is a trigger for poor health. Um, you know, I talked about this book that I had read last year called The Body Keeps the Score, written by a Boston University professor of psychiatry, Dr. Vander Kolk. Great book. I recommend it highly, and it's going to play into part with today's podcast. So um, a lot of times there's a lot deeper things than, than you realize. So any family doctor that's practiced for two days will realize half of what walks into their office is a lot of times emotionally based or triggered, and it causes real disease. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And I have a special guest with me here today, somebody I'm very familiar with. As a matter of fact, we've been married 42 years, um, my lovely wife, Jenny, who helps me out a lot with these podcasts. And she had a great experience recently, and I decided that she needs to be on the podcast because she attended a wellness retreat um, on a place outside of Nashville called Onsite. Since that time, I've recommended some of my patients with a lot of emotional trauma uh, attend that, and it's been very successful. So we're going to be talking with her today about why and and how and a lot of things. She has some great theories about um, the vagal nerve, and also they use this book, The Body Keeps the Score. Uh, a lot in their teachings, but it was, it was a really good experience for her. So, Jenny, thank you for being on the show with me today. You've done all these shows for me, but you've never really been on this side of the camera. Yeah, you have, have a much prettier face than I do, so welcome. Um, so tell me about OnSite. Why did you go there in the first place? Uh, well, first, um, it is so different being on this side of the camera than over there. This, this makes me a little nervous. It's a lot easier, really. Yeah, and being with you makes me a little nervous because <laughs> you're smart, and um, that's why I have my notes, guys. Uh, but what is onsite? I think you described that well. It was an emotional, um, it's a, an emotional wellness center. So they have two, one in California and one right outside in Nashville. And what they do is have workshops. I mean, what they provide is workshops where they have experiential type of therapy that works you through living a centered life. And I just would be, it's more like being connected with yourself. And so it's really uh, the way that they described trauma, and especially on your website, which I'll put it up on uh, uh, behind me. And at the end of the video, I'll give reference to where you can find more information about on-site. But the way that they described trauma was not really so much as what happened in the past, but how um, what is happening in the present. So in other words, your, uh, whatever responses you have to, to what we would call everyday life, uh, conflict, uh, um, uh, a change of plans, or someone didn't show up at, at your dinner on time, just any circumstances, your response is, uh, is, is kind of determined by how well your emotions are connected to your body, how you're connected with, with your, with yourself. And so I was very interested in that. Um, and again, uh, when you, when you go there, you're not like, uh, measuring trauma that has absolutely nothing to do with it. It's just basically about educating your, uh, you getting educated on what's happening in your, in your brain when you respond to certain situations because the body does uh, hold the score. So I think that, that they mentioned this book a lot and then it kind of was like, oh my gosh, this has 
so much to do with optimal health. And uh, so that, why did I go? Is because I wanted to kind of unplug, get off the grid and reconnect with my, with myself and um, kind of get to kind of what I would call unpack all of my timeline and, uh, and reprocess the way that I respond to conflict or anything. Kind of reminds me of Dr. Peter Atia, who I follow um, a lot. Um, when he checked himself into this um, small place in Bowling Green, Kentucky, uh, very similar. He was looking at his emotional side of things, and it really helped him. To me, out of his new book, Outlive, that's the most interesting chapter in there. Um, you know, he's a really, really smart guy, but this showed that he's human. And it was just a really eye-opening, humbling experience for him, and certainly I enjoyed reading it. So on-site is not just for people that have had some tremendous yeah, yeah. trauma in their lives. It's also um, a place where you can really learn to deal with people because in most trauma, ongoing trauma, dealing a lot with people. Yes, I well, they – you have like three types of trauma. You have the PTSD, which you have just a single incident that kind of hijacked your emotions. So that could be a death in the family. That could be a car wreck. That could be um, um, anything that kind of shocks your system. Is uh, maybe a, a cancer diagnosis. It's something that just oh my gosh, you know, my whole life is is changing. Uh, your second one would be kind of like. Um, uh, developmental trauma, which would mean like from birth, there is, uh, um, you maybe had a situation in your family in which the provider in your family, mom, dad, uh, aunt, uncle, whatever, were not there for you. They were, they were absent. And then, so therefore you're, you are adjusting developmentally to that, to that missing link if you want to call it and then the third one is complex and complex trauma is um is when you kind of live in in periods of of change all the time it's complex and uh so you learn in your brain how to adapt because you are kind of always in a survival mode you're you're moving to get to where you can be at rest in yourself. So there's three, and again, they they deal very little with that. They just explain, uh, you know, we, we have lectures in the morning, and it's uh, by therapist, a great team of clinicians, and they give you kind of a, a couple hours of lectures, and they explain this, and then you go off into your workshops uh, to kind of experience that whatever they were talking about because again it's it's a process which i'll uh, kind of explain towards the end all i know is you came back a much more calmer person <laughs> than uh you know you're definitely type a uh, workaholic type always doing something way more than i am and to me it really calmed you down you know we talk a lot of in medicine about the the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous systems, the vagal nerve, yeah. which I know you dealt with a lot. The sympathetic nervous system is called the fight or flight response. It's that part of your brain that can save your life in a, in a horrible situation. Uh, somebody's after you or something like that. The parasympathetic is more your relaxed phase, the part of your nervous system that keeps your keeps you breathing without even being aware of it. Uh, does you know performs your digestion and it's a healing time so you got you really got into that a yeah. vagal nerve tone which we talk about a lot there's a lot of things you can do to calm that down from breathing to exercise to meditation to prayer tell me a little bit about what you learned about that um, the vagal nerve tone um, well, first, I did not know that the vagal nerve was the longest nerve in the body. So, um, so what they did was really put it up there as kind of in a ladder because, again, your your the vagal nerve, as I understand, it, is from it sends signals from the brain 
to all the organs it, of the body. It starts in your brain, goes all the way down to your gut. That's right. why we talk about yeah. the gut-brain connection. Yeah. But it touches almost every organ in your body. So it's very responsible for driving your whole system. Yeah. And I, I thought it was interesting. I'm just going to throw a little bit of these out. Um, if These are some of the, what we would call, symptoms of trauma. And this is how I know kind of probably everybody out there has some of these symptoms. But it was literally worry, if you worry a lot. Um, if you are hypervigilant, you're quick to make a change or quick to fix something. Um, if you have any kind of eating disorder, anything, like if you turn to an eating, uh, to overeating or not eating enough, it's that disorder. Um, uh, definitely anxiety. So if you if you deal with anxiety or any panic situation, this is right down your alley. There's, there's trauma stored in the body. Uh, it even goes into the irritability, the chronic pain, headaches, insomnia. And that was, um, so you, know, you talk a lot about sleep and all of these things that we, that we experience is keeping us from the very thing that preventative medicine is, is for, is actually to prevent disease. But when you have trauma stored in the body or you have some kind of something that some signal that was that is shorted, if you want to say it like that, then um, then you're going to have illness. You're going to you're going to be sick. You're not going to sleep. Your your stomach's going to hurt. All these things. And yes, I think you can take Digest Shield and you can take a lot of stuff. And um, you know you can take your magnesium to sleep. And you're, you're but uh, but again, if it's if it's in there then it's going to be periods that you sleep well, but then all it takes is just a little something to remind you of, of your pattern. I'm going to use it like that, your pattern of thinking, and then you're back into not sleeping, anxious and panicky and headaches and, and you know, your gut's hurting and all that kind of stuff. So um, that didn't answer your question, but I thought that was interesting because, you know, you talk about all of the things that that keep you from that optimal health. And really, it stems back to to trauma. There's no doubt about that. I saw a patient last week that had a laundry list of chronic illnesses was coming to me because she wasn't getting answers. And she was on a terrible long list of medicines and had seen many doctors through the years. And there was just something that told me that it wasn't the whole story because she'd had a recent trigger when all her symptoms had gotten a hundred times worse. And I, and I started talking about the trigger, what could have possibly been. And it was a, one of the relatives that had um, unexpectedly come back into her life. And she'd experienced a lot of childhood trauma associated with this person. And it really triggered her and all her symptoms were back. And that the, root cause of her problem goes back to that childhood trauma that she has never dealt with. Mm -hmm. So as a matter of fact, I recommend an onsite oh, for her. Oh, it'd be awesome. It'd be awesome. And, but there are, the body does have a way of keeping score. This psychiatrist, you know, and he, he's a high level, well-known psychiatrist that wrote the book, The Body Keeps the Score. He realized after many years of practice and his specialty is trauma. Uh, he runs a trauma center um, and does the psychological part of it, and which is as important as the physical um, because it can last forever. But anyway, he realized he was practicing medicine the wrong way. He wasn't really getting to the cause of the problem. Mm -hmm. He was just using medications, psychiatric medications that were taught to write, um, to treat the symptoms. He wasn't getting to the cause. Mm -hmm. So it's a great read, and I think anybody could read this because we've all suffered some traumas in our life. I mean, life is, life is tough sometimes, just living and getting along. Look at, look at our world now. I mean, you know, the world seems like it's always on fire to me. But um, So tell me about the, the thing. Let's get into the vagal nerve a little bit more. Tell me a little bit about the, the triangle that you were explaining yes. to me. Um, okay, the vagal the vagal nerve, you know, like I said, is is runs from the brain all the way down, and uh, and what the study 
of the vagal nerve is is called the vagal uh, polyvagal theory and that's just the study of this of this vagus nerve so we did a lot of that um, and its role in a emotions and regulating those emotions, your social connection with other people, and your fear response. So that vagal nerve, that study called the polyvagal nerve is addressing those three things. Being able to control your emotions. So if you struggle with controlling your emotions, then again, we have something that's 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 um, shorted out in that in that signal from the brain. Uh, so what they did is there was a ladder, and so at the bottom of the ladder, and uh, again in the morning, you we would probably uh, maybe one of the first couple of days is you would uh, to experience that is if you were kind of in a shut down state of mind, then you might get up and walk to a certain place and and you would kind of sense the room of the people who were who were shut kind of in a what well, on the vagal nerve is called the dorsal vagal and so it's kind of a shut down your end kind of you're kind of in a depressive mode uh, right up from that would be you could get up and they'll say okay if you're in a fight or flight that's why that's probably what brought you here is the fight or flight then uh, that is called the sympathetic part of the of the vagal nerve and that sympathetic is really a protection mode so that means that you're in you're you're driven to protect yourself or those people that you love you're kind of on high alert right yeah uh, hypervigilant all the time so okay. then it was kind of interesting how the room started to divide is those who who were really you know they were shut down they weren't even in the fight or flight anymore and then the one then that at the top of the ladder was the ventral vagal and that is your connected part that means you're able to self-regulate and that um the way that they explained that to me was like a thermometer is like you're like conflict comes in and you're able if you are connected with your body the brain is like that in that in that vagal nerve you are connected then you it's you're at that top level where you're able to regulate what's going on acknowledge the stress and then explore those options so you don't go into the fight or flight and and get the anxiety and the panic and all that you're not in that that you are uh you're you're connected with your body and you're able to process the situation in a healthy way and then what so once we did that vagal nerve thing and this is what you're talking about the triangle uh and i mean obviously in that situation nobody went to the place where they were connected or they probably would not have been there you know mm -hmm. is it most of us were in a uh, you know sympathetic state where fight or flight protective mode hypervigilant vigilant wanting to fix things before they got worse you know wanting to protect each other uh those kind of things most most people were there and that's that that's because they deal with anxiety so if you're out there and anxiety is your best friend, then, um, then keep listening. Just keep listening. Just give me a shot at trying to explain the, tra the drama triangle. And this, um, this is how we connect. Our, our drama triangle is how we connect to that vagal nerve. Um, that is uh, at that triangle is they call it um gosh i'm sorry it has a victim yeah i know a, what it has but they, but that thing's called it's named by somebody yeah, carplin you, carplin yeah, triangle okay. carplin is by some guy okay and, and but i'll put that up there too so that um you'll know uh, so this triangle is um, you is you roam between the persecutor, the victim, and the rescuer. So if you are, and again, you're responding to a conflict. So I'm not trauma. Yeah, you know, I'm not in a trauma. I'm just there's a conflict, and my response if if I am overwhelmed, that means I'm overwhelmed. Then I'm going to go into that sympathetic fight or flight. Or I'm going to shut down if I'm depressed because I just can't deal with anymore. But if I'm in those two things, then I am, I'm, that triangle is where I'm going to be. That's what we work in our social connections in life. These are life connections. 
Um, so then, or you could be, if you're in a victim, you take no responsibility for it. And that you'll see some people in that victim state where they just, they own to nothing. You know, they own nothing, and then the others are feeling overwhelmed because they own everything. Uh, then when you do that, you go into the rescuer, which, again, you're going to save whoever is vulnerable in there. You're going to try to fix it, you know, because remember, you, you're you overwhelmed. That's where the victim feeling comes in is you're overwhelmed, and then you run to try to rescue it, fix it, fix somebody, uh, change the situation to where it's not going to feel that way anymore. Um, and then you may run over into the persecutor, which would be if it didn't work, whatever you did did not work, then you might feel shame. So there you are in that part of the triangle. So you feel bad because whatever you tried did not work and it's all your fault or you're mad because somebody else didn't do it. So this triangle of how we relate to each other is all based on the brain and its function and, and the way it signals down through your, your vagal nerve. So I was very interested in that because, again, um, that's most of us in the world who are in that fight or flight, and all of us are trying to relate each other, to each other. And that, that Carplan you know, drama, that means when I say drama, relationships are not just like be happy relationships are always a series of little tiny conflicts you know how are we going to get supper tonight who's going to get it uh who's going to take the kids to school who's picking them up um what you know who's all of those things that's called daily life and so that drama triangle was huge for me because now there was a way to re to there, there was a way to work on it because I wanted to be in that top level, which would be that um, the top of the triangle, which is that ventral vagal, where I was connected with my body. I could assess the situation, and I could also, you know, talk through my options before I responded. Um, so that brings me kind of to what what it looks like. If first of all, do you have any questions about that? <laughs> no, it makes sense to me. I mean, we're all kind of victims of circumstance, right. and we yes. all have a perpetrator yes. because we have to deal with people, yes. and we all have a rescuer yes. that we may go to. But I see that a lot with people, especially women. They try to save somebody. You know, they get into four or five marriages where they think they can fix this person, and they really uh, can't. So The you, interesting thing is we had people with spiritual trauma. There because there when we they went to the triangle, the Carplin triangle, and they went to the rescuer side, it was always to the church. And then, yep. the, you know, then they would try to, you know, throw a verse on it or, you know, a Bible verse on it or they would um, or they would isolate themselves in the church to get away from the 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 trauma. So it when it doesn't work, then you really are losing that spirit of in you that is the spirit of hope because that is where that comes from i mean we this was like a science and spirituality married together it was like the body truly is a miracle and that spirit is what your, your spirit that the soul the spirit the 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 what lifts you up and um that triggers the brain and the, then the brain comes down. So that, that was an interesting for me is to find out all the people that really had trauma going to the side of rescuing with the church. You know, um, we all have had trauma. And the body has a, an amazing way of healing itself if you give it time. Um, but certainly this is a better way to deal with things, especially in dealing with everyday circumstances and people. So... What, how did this help you to deal with it? Did you learn to say no or give me the clue as to how this helped you in the end? A few pearls of wisdom as into how to stay in that upper side, which is, I assume is a parasympathetic mode rather than yeah, the fight yeah. or flight. Correct. But so how are you dealing with things now that's changed since you went to that? Um, well, I, you know, when you say change, um, I think knowledge 
unlocks everything. Like you don't, if you don't know, you don't know. So, so um, you realize what you're doing and the way you're <laughs> right. thinking. Yeah. And so the, you're right. The yeah, first I, step I is I, 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 why is this, why right. is this, this is why. Yeah, yeah. And so you you can redirect the way you react. Right. So, so in other words, what I had and I, and everyone has to go through uh, or work through it. So it's literally work doing your piece of work um, is to figure out what is your pattern where, you know, are you, when you are victimized, that means um, something comes at you or you create something, then are, is it that are you overwhelmed or are you the one that takes no responsibility? So you got to figure out how your personality is. For myself, so you're asking about me, is I am, I would be victimized by being overwhelmed. And then overwhelming would take me straight to the, I would go straight to rescuer first because I, you know, my, um, my Enneagram is a two. So I love to, to help people. And this is where it gets kind of dangerous is that if your basic personality is, is a helper, then you're real quick to go to the rescuer because you can, where you would normally help people because they need help in this situation, you are helping people to manipulate a change. So in other words, you're trying to fix them or you're trying to fix the situation, maybe get rid of them before somebody comes home or, you know, you're trying to rescue the, uh, the situation, the situation. And then when the rescuing for me doesn't work, that means I didn't fix it. Or if I did and someone didn't like the way I fixed it, then I would do the self-blame. So I would do shame. Shame. Shame for what? That I would feel it. Mm -hmm. I would feel shame. So when I say when it holds, when it, when it keeps the score, is that, that that goes way, way back. Like where my brain, and, and again, um, they take you through, like you work on your own timeline where your brain started to adjust to the small circumstances in your life. Like I was saying, whether it was a, a quick single event of trauma or whether it was a de developmental or whether it was a complex trauma, you work through what your brain did to adjust to that trauma. And then once we figure, once I, not we, because this is all individual, once I figured that out um, by drawing pictures, by acting it out, I realize, ah, I go straight from overwhelmed to fixing. I go from fixing to shame. And then from shame, I'll go back into the, my victim state where I'm back at it. And when you do that triangle enough in a hypervigilant way, um, or a fight or flight way, because that's what the sympathetic is. Uh, and you stay there long enough, like I'm 65, you're whatever, you're 68, right? You know, when you do that years and years and years, then you get tired. And then you come see, uh, <laughs> you come see Tom, because that's why you see so many tired people yeah, exactly. is they're going in that triangle and they mm -hmm. are just tired of going it's from just a vicious victim, circle. Yeah. Victim to persecutor, whatever. So, what have you, you told me you've learned to at times say, that's not my problem. Yeah. So okay. what I do is I, I reinvented the answers. So in other words, when I, when a situation is coming at me now, um, instead of being overwhelmed, then I, I know the first thing I should think is acknowledge that it is a situation. Acknowledge it's bad. We're not responding to it. We're acknowledging the fact that this is not a good thing. And then from there, rather than to automatically go to my rescuer, I say, is this mine to fix? Is this my problem? Because I've acknowledged it in, in the victim, rather being overwhelmed by it, like everything's my problem when not everything is my problem. I'm not overwhelmed, I simply acknowledge it. And then when I, before I do anything, I ask myself, is this mine to do? Is anyone asking me to do anything or am I just doing it because, I f because 
again, I'm in the rescue, I'm in the fight or flight mode, and I don't want to be there. I want to be in that, that ventral uh, vagal state, that, what do you call it? Parasympathetic. Parasympathetic, that's yeah. where I want to be. And so to get there, I do that. So then I shift over, and where it's the persecutor, I always say, again, I have the power to change the narrative. I have the power. So in other words, the way I think about that situation and that victim thing, that means something happened or I created something that happened, um, I have the power to change the outcome. I have the power to decide how I want to think about that. And then from there, I'm, I'm home free because now I'm in that those options and I can make choices, then that becomes to, um, to kind of the takeaways is that you are your own agent. And that was so powerful for me is like, I've always let other people be my agent because I wanted a, to make sure that everyone is happy. Why? Cause I'm in the fight or flight. Why? Because somewhere in my whole raise you know uh, growing up is I learned how to adapt and make changes and that signal that I must do it right so I know it's like I've got to do it right and I think a lot of kids think that they have to take care of their parents and such and so. you know it sounds selfish but you really do need to take care of yourself first if you're going to be happy effective and healthy kind of like putting your own you know in the they tell you on the airplane when the gas, the oxygen mask drop down, put yours on first and then help, you know, the one beside you. But um, And another so, way of saying that is like, instead of taking care of yourself, it's be connected to yourself. Be connected to yourself. Yeah. I love that. I, yeah. I'm glad you went yeah. to this well, I, conference. Can I end with my little three takeaways? Okay, three yeah, takeaways. Because, um, uh, you know, besides, you, you kind of know how I use the triangle now. Um, and again, for every single person, that's different depending on their personality and depending on their trauma, whether or not it was the PTSD or whether it was developmental or whether it was complex. But my takeaways that that definitely have um, gotten me excited about change is that the realization that all sustainable change happens in two degree shifts. And um, I Again, I don't know if they came up with that, but that two degree shift, I immediately went to the little store and bought me the mug that said two degree shift because I wanted to remind myself is that if I want this to be a sustainable change in my life and learn to live connected with my body to, again, release the score, release that. I mean, release what happened, whatever, where, wherever you were on your timeline in which you adjusted the, and became unhealthy. All the always remembers when you, when is it that what you were doing became unhealthy? That means you had symptoms like uh, eating disorders or headaches or panic. Well, then once you get rid of that, then the key is to keep in that ventral, uh, that ventral vagal. So there's two, two degree shifts. And then the second one was that healing is a practice. And I loved that. So in other words, it's not like it's done. Like it, it's not like you're healed. You have to do this every day, like practicing it, guitar. Exactly. If you don't play it exactly. every day, you're not going to exactly. be good at it. Yeah. So you're saying the two degree shifts means that you don't, you're not going to change all at once. Two degrees means two degrees at a time. Is that what you're well, saying? Cause I went up to the guy and asked him, cause I was like, I was thinking two degree was like to the right. And we went around to the three. That's what I would think. Okay. And it's not, it's an expansion. Uh, like you expand. Hmm. So maybe so, it's exponential. So in other words, two degrees becomes he, four degrees. Right, becomes, okay. right. Because see, if you win it, he said if you go in uh, kind of what, the, you know, you go to the right and you go like this, then, then you, then if let's just say something you did, you you kind of fell back into your your that again that Carplin triangle of being fight or flight in the sympathetic uh, state, you would you would automatically think you were going back okay. to the beginning. And, so and it, it's I like that. It's so it, it has a limit if you go around that way, but if you're expanding Correct. exponentially. Yeah, so, you never, you never. okay, so you got the two-degree shift. And the you have is the practice. healing is a daily practice. Yeah. And what's the third the one? The third one is my favorite, which is trust, trust the process. In other words, um, you have to believe you have to believe that the, that the brain can re 
connect that it can that it can be that it can change that that you have that you can change the narrative that you can change that that you can you can reprogram it and if you don't trust that process um of of healing then again you're back to square you know, you have to believe it right. and i think you've told your patients that, you is that if you do it. not believe you're going to get better you're not going to yeah. get better it's called having a positive attitude that goes a long way with uh and you can almost tell who has a positive attitude when you talk to a person and somebody who's negative so i try to stay away from negative people because you're not going to really change them too much. So you need to be positive yourself, and you do need to trust the process. Just like if you practice something, you're going to get better at it. Mm-hmm. Take, for example, me on my guitar. I'm not that. I'm not a really good musician, but I've really gotten a lot better just by practicing it. And, and, and he's gotten a lot better because he played for my family for Christmas the first time Blackbird. in front. He played Blackburn, and um, I was, I've never been that proud. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, and this has been so interesting. I'm glad you got to do this. It was, it was great for her. There were no telephones, no televisions, and, you know, we didn't talk for a whole week. That's the first time in 42 years, mm, or maybe know. longer than that. But know. So the body keeps the score. Um, on-site is the, the place, the wellness center that she went to. So read about it and um, keep this stuff in mind because it's really as important as anything I'll ever talk about is your emotional healing and dealing with big traumas and little traumas. Um, so... Thank you, Jenny, for doing this. Uh, Let's go get something to eat.